Well, good afternoon. I'm delighted to see so many of you here, and particularly so many international guests here from over 30 nations, from every corner of our globe. And I doubt that even five years ago, this type of event would have drawn such an impressive cast list. And that reflects the growing importance of cyber to our world. Now, you can't uh, come to a conference that is organized with uh, RUSI, our oldest defense think tank, without at least one nod to history. A hundred years ago, in the skies above the Somme, the world witnessed the first major demonstration of the awesome power of the aeroplane, a new technology offering competence, unparalleled reach, unprecedented speed, and destructive power unconstrained by borders or boundaries. Air power was the transformative technology of 20th century warfare. We're here today to discuss its 21st century successor, cyber power. Now, the information age has brought huge benefits. It's opened up our world. It's changed the way we do our banking, the way we book our holidays, the way we organize our social life. But the more reliant we are on electronic networks, the more vulnerable we are to cyber attack. Our cyber adversaries can target us anywhere on the planet, not only stealing our information, but exploiting, coercing, or gaining psychological advantage over us, and potentially dealing a sucker punch to our systems, potentially disrupting our armaments, our energy supplies, or even our systems of government. And what gives cyber its added potency is its availability. Anyone with a laptop and a clever bit of open source encrypted software can now do us harm. And any threat we face, state-sponsored aggression, global terror, attacks on elections and electoral machinery and other key features of democracy, lone wolf attacks, any of these can now have a cyber dimension. And what's more, these threats are growing. Last year, GCHQ here detected twice as many national security level cyber incidents, 200 per month, twice as many as the year before. And we know that hostile actors are already developing and deploying advanced capabilities. We've seen non-state actors like Dash using social media to radicalize their followers. We've watched cyber criminals leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. It's not only the Yahoo hack where data was stolen from 500 million people in the biggest publicly disclosed cyber breach in history, but it's the fact that 90% of large organizations reported last year that they had suffered some form of security breach. The average cost of the most severe online security breaches for bigger companies starts at almost one and a half million pounds. That's doubled in a year. And virtual threats have physical consequences. It's only a matter of time, in our view, before we have to deal with a major attack on British interests. That's why in our Strategic Defense and Security Review last year, cyber was listed as a tier one threat, up there with terrorism or a major nat natural hazard. But we're not here, you've not been here over the last couple of days to scare ourselves, but to protect ourselves. We do that by learning three important lessons from that age of air power that I described. 
First, we have to innovate. A hundred years ago, those first pilots on the Somme were flying wooden and canvas aircraft. Today, we're building fifth generation lightning strike fighters. Britain is already a world leader in cyber security, but we can't afford any complacency. That's why we're investing some 1.9 billion pounds across government, doubling the level of previous investment to protect the United Kingdom from attack, to help us keep ahead of the curve. And we're already seeing that investment bearing fruit. Earlier this year, I announced the development of the new Cyber Security Operations Center at the Ministry of Defense, bringing together our defensive cyber activity to safeguard our military networks and systems against cyber threats. This month, we launched the new National Cyber Security Center in Victoria, just a stone's throw away from us here this afternoon. That center is uniting Britain's brightest brains from across Whitehall and across the private sector to defend our cyber infrastructure. And today, I can announce that we're investing a further 265 million pounds from April in a pioneering approach to root out cyber vulnerabilities within our military platforms and our wider cyber dependent systems. And that will include not simply our legacy platforms, but new platforms coming on stream, such as the Queen Elizabeth class carriers. The United Kingdom is a world leader in cybersecurity, and we recognize that cyber risk is one of the greatest threats that we face in the modern world. So it is crucial that we innovate and stay ahead of this ever-changing danger. By investing in this program, we're helping to ensure that the United Kingdom is fully protected. But this isn't just about defense. It must also be about offense. It's important that our adversaries know that there is a price to pay if they use cyber weapons against us. And it's vital that we have the capability to project power in cyberspace as in other domains. We must therefore exploit the opportunities that cyber presents to deliver military effects. The government announced a year ago that we're developing a capability through the National Offensive Cyber Program in which the Ministry of Defense and GCHQ are close partners. We also said in our strategic defense review that our commitment to invest 2% of our GDP in defense would help ensure that our armed forces will increasingly be able to operate as effectively in cyberspace as they do by land, sea, or air. And since then, we have begun to integrate offensive cyber into our military planning alongside the full range of military effects. And we will continue to develop and exploit cyber's potential to complement and enhance our conventional military capabilities and assets. And that brings me to my second point. We can't operate or develop the right capabilities without the right skills. Over the last hundred years, we've relied on brilliant aviation pioneers like Sir Thomas Sopwith, R.J. Mitchell, and Frank Whittle to reach for the skies. We want to match now that conveyor belt of talent in cyberspace. We're not just looking for people with IT expertise. From Vietnam through to Afghanistan and Iraq, we've learned that perception is nine-tenths of the war. Today, hostile actors and their agents see cyber as a way of controlling the narrative. And we need to work harder at combating their lies 
with faster truth. That's why here we've set up 77 Brigade and the 1st Reconnaissance Brigade to learn new ways to improve information flows, to influence capabilities, to counter hybrid warfare techniques, and to improve battlefield intelligence. The pioneering techniques of these cyber soldiers will now influence our whole armed forces. And we're also giving thought to the next generation of online warriors to continue recruiting the best people. We've created a bespoke test to identify military personnel with an aptitude for cyber work. The Defense Cyber Aptitude Tests assess an individual's cognitive abilities through a number of advanced challenges. We're currently rolling the test out now in our technical training programs. And in the meantime, we're making sure that all our staff have a cyber schooling by establishing a new defense cyber school based at our academy in Shrivenham. My third and final point is this. Just as NATO allies work together to protect and secure Europe's skies. Just as the United Kingdom this last summer was policing the airspace of the Baltic region to counter Russian belligerence, so we require similar global partnerships to address a cyber threat that knows no bounds. I'm proud that the United Kingdom already enjoys strong bilateral relationships in this area. With our French friends, we're using our new combined joint expeditionary force to reinforce our two-star military cyber coordination group, sharing best practice between Britain and France to improve the defense of our military IT networks and to train cyber specialists. We're also tightening our ties with our US partners. Last month, when Secretary Carter visited London, we signed a memorandum of understanding, building on our existing partnership by enabling more collaborative research and development together and greater information sharing on both offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. And we will work closely in this area with our other allies in the Five Eyes intelligence network, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. But an effective response to the dangers of cyber requires all nations in NATO to step up. We can only be as strong as our weakest link. And Britain is determined to do its bit. We may be leaving the European Union, but we are stepping up our commitment to European and Alliance cyber security. That's why at the Warsaw Summit, we advocated that all NATO nations should sign the Cyber Defense Pledge, should agree to strengthen our cyber defenses, should agree to strengthen national infrastructures and networks as a matter of priority, to ensure that the Alliance is strong and resilient in the face of cyber threats. Britain's commitment to spending a minimum of 2% GDP on defense means that we can invest in a military that is cyber trained, cyber secure, and cyber enabled with the ability to fight in every domain in any future conflict. At Warsaw, we, advocate, we advocated NATO recognition of cyber as a domain of operations in which NATO must defend itself as effectively as it does in each of the other domains. Recognizing that will bring more effective organization of skills and resources, will bring integration of cyber defense capabilities into our operational planning, and will better protect our deployed forces and give us an improved NATO ability to maintain freedom of action across the global cyber commons. 
Yet perhaps the greatest contribution will be to enlarge our understanding of the terms of engagement. One of the most devastating effects of cyber weaponry is its capacity to deepen the fog of war, to add additional layers of ambiguity to the actions of an aggressor. So as NATO reaffirms the relevance of international law in cyberspace, we must be clear that cyber could constitute an armed attack while preparing our full spectrum response and considering what sort of political and public support will be required by such a response. And just as we must also think more closely about the impact that cyber will have on the nature of military operations and objectives and on our tactics and on our strategy in future. There aren't easy answers here, but by gathering the right network of people together through this conference, I believe we've made a start and I'm already looking forward to next year's conference in the Netherlands. Let me say in conclusion, I began by mentioning the transformative power of air power. In ending, I'd note that air power didn't just transform 20th century warfare, it transformed society itself. Sky used to be a limit, it isn't now. We can get a flight to almost anywhere in the globe. Tomorrow we might be catching a flight into space. So my hope, too, is that if we get cyber right, we have the potential too, not just to bolster our capability and improve our security, but to bring in the jobs, the investment, the talent to help power our economies for decades to come. And if we do that job properly, 100 years from now, our successors will look back on this moment, the dawn of a new cyber age, as the moment when a potentially devastating threat turned into a dazzling economic and social opportunity. Thank you. Yes, sure. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of State very kindly has uh, agreed to, to take some questions. So in the uh, uh, procedure of the last few days, if you can raise your hands, we'll bring you a mic, and if, uh, if you can introduce yourself. First one here, please. James Hurst from BFBS and Forces TV. Um, can you just clarify the 265 million pounds uh, that you've announced today. I, I presume that is part of the 1.9 billion in the SDSR, or is this additional money you've announced? But it might sound like a, a naive question, but I think a lot of people have difficulty visual, because they can't visualize cyber, whereas you can visualize conventional war. To the ordinary service man or woman who says, every penny counts at the moment, why is 250 million pounds on cyber value for money. Well, thank you, James. First of all, the uh, 265 million is quite separate from the 1.9 billion being spent right across government. This is uh, uh, an allocation from the defense budget, a program that will run now for the next 10 years and is uh, going to be spent, as I said, on investigating all the potential cyber vulnerabilities that we have in our existing platforms, ships, aircraft, and, and networks, and our platforms to come. Uh, these are hard to visualize, but I think people are beginning to understand what hacking means, how our adversaries or uh, those who wish us harm are uh, trying to get inside our networks. We will be spending this money to secure the rest of our defense investment against cyber attacks. So we will be methodically investigating each of our platforms and the platforms that are now coming
to make sure they are fully protected. And that will include the Queen Elizabeth class carriers that I mentioned, uh, the successor submarines, and, uh, and all our new investment. Um, Sean Connolly from the Press Association. Um, Secretary of State, which is the bigger threat to Britain um, in terms of cyber infiltration, Russia or China? And also, do you consider the Russian fleet heading towards the English Channel to be an act of, uh, to be a hostile act by Mr. Putin? Well, cyber is itself uh, a number one, tier one threat, which we recognized back in the 2010 Strategic Defense Review and we reaffirmed in the 2015 uh, uh, review. It is right up there with one of them as one of the biggest threats uh, to this country, and I hope I've illustrated that we are determined to deal with it, spending two billion across uh, government and the additional money that I've announced uh, today. And that threat can come from uh, other states, but also from uh, non-state actors, such as terrorist groups, as we've seen with uh, Daesh. Uh, the Russian uh, uh, fleet that is now sailing from north, uh, presumably now down into the uh, Mediterranean, is uh, clearly designed uh, to, uh, uh, to test the alliance. It's being marked every step of the way by the Royal Navy and ships and uh, planes of uh, other NATO members as well. Uh, it's clearly designed, like Russian long-range aviation, to test our response and any weaknesses in the alliance. And, um, you know, we must make sure we respond in, in due measure. That uh, fleet will be marked, sh shadowed uh, every, every inch of the way until it is out of, uh, out of the, uh, the British area. It's Michael David Willits, uh, Defence Editor of The Sun. You spoke about cyber offence. I'm just wondering, is the UK currently carrying out any cyber attacks on an enemy, I'm thinking more specifically about uh, Islamic State or Daesh, and maybe if I could be pushed a little further on specifics, are cyber attacks being carried out or helping the uh, current assault on Mosul? Well, David, I'm not going into uh, operational specifics, but yes, you know we are conducting military operations against Daesh as part of the international coalition, and I can confirm that we are using offensive cyber for the first time in this campaign. Particularly anyone who's not a journalist, to be quite honest. Yes. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, I've got one at the back, sorry. Uh, Peter Taylor, uh, UK MOD, not a journalist, answering your call for help. Uh, would Secretary of State like to comment on the partnership uh, with industry to deal with the threats of cyber, cyber and whether he's confident that in, over the next century governments will retain the initiative on dealing with the threats? Well, on the first, thank you. On the first, we're working extremely closely uh, with industry. I think uh, the larger, uh, in terms of uh, protection and security, the larger companies understand this threat now. I think some of them were um, you know, a little uh, slow a few years ago to understand that they had already been attacked. Um, but they have now, I think, uh, you know, woken up to the threat and there is very close cooperation now with them, particularly uh, with those companies involved in our critical national infrastructure um, and where there is, of course, still work to do along the supply chains to understand exactly where the vulnerabilities are. And the defense industry itself, of course, is cooperating with us to uh, help us uh, protect our, um, uh, the assets that we're developing in common. Sorry, there was a second bit to your question, which I, did you not? Uh, the second part of my question, uh, Secretary of State, is whether or not uh, governments will retain the initiative, uh, and I'm referring to uh, the case of Snowden, when Microsoft, uh, sorry, when Apple chose not to allow the US government uh, backdoor access to its encryption uh, uh, because presumably uh, Apple no longer felt the confidence in the US government uh, uh, in, in their surveillance operations following the Snowden revelations. 
Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very important question. I mean, here we have had cooperation from the, the large technology uh, companies. Uh, where necessary, of course, we can reach for the law and amend the law and update it to match the development of new, new technologies. But we prefer uh, companies to cooperate with us uh, voluntarily. And so far in the UK, with a couple of exceptions, uh, in, in a couple of areas not related to defence, they have. Uh, Peter Robinson from the Institute. Um, we, we had a variety of academics, industry and military um, talk in cyber terms about this sovereignty gap. So the sort of difference between almost what the state can do and what industry can do and, and how we might breach that bubble, you know, the sovereign state retaining the legal right to conduct violence. Um, do you envisage a possibility in the future where it might not only be states that can conduct acts of uh, cyber violence. Do you think it's possible at some stage in the future that some actors, not necessarily even the UK, might employ something akin to privateering, to enabling companies to undertake offensive cyber activity on behalf of themselves? Well, it's an interesting question, but um, you know, I think my answer would be I hope not. I think the use of force is, um, you know, is, is, is part and parcel of a sovereign state. And I think the use of force has to be authorized uh, properly um, through correct uh, governance and indeed accountability. And that is certainly the case um, so far as we're concerned when uh, any offensive, uh, the use of any offensive cyber capability is contemplated, that there are rules in place, there is a proper governance structure, and that uh, ministers are accountable for that use of force. So I wouldn't want to see us go down that uh, privateering route that, uh, that you suggest. I'll offer, uh, uh, if I may, uh, so I'll just take, oh, take that one from Nick and then... Uh. So hi, Group Captain Nick Hartley from Joint Forces Command. You highlighted the analogy of cyber to the growth of air power. Yeah. Traditionally, the MOD has been used to support government in terms of national resilience, whether it be firemen strikes, floods, foot and mouth. I wondered what your views were on how the MOD could support national cyber resilience and our role through the National Cyber Security Centre. Well, it's a good question. I mean, first, obviously, we're part of that resilience, addressing vulnerabilities in resilience and making sure that the critical national infrastructure that supports our daily life, you know, is properly protected. But then we also have a role if something goes wrong in terms of military assistance to the to the civil power where we would be ready, for example, if, uh, if energy supplies were, were disrupted or whatever, we would be ready to offer uh, military assistance there, not simply to, um, uh, to help people with the necessities of life, but to help get these networks up, up and running again. So there is a kind of dual function there, which we're very alive to. Yes, um, I shall take the opportunity. Um, you've now, you know, you've been in the Ministry of Defence for a while now. You've been here through probably most of our growth in, in cyber. One of the big themes, I think, of the last uh, two days has been uh, learning by doing. Um, how close do you think uh, the, the Ministry is um, and, and, and the services in terms of people, processes and, and, and structures uh, to being in a place where you feel you know, fully confident that we are in the best possible place we can be? Well, I hope we're getting into the best uh, possible place. We've put the, put the resources aside. We've uh, built cyber into our operational commands, not setting up a separate organization, uh, in trying to integrate it. We've got our eye on the skills that, uh, that we need. Um, we're launching, we're part of you know, government. We're launching the national cyber strategy early next month across government, and we play our part in that. Um, you know, cyber is a threat. And um, you know we have to be, you know we have to wake up to that threat. I think we are waking up to that threat, um, but I wouldn't be complacent about it at all. I think we have to, uh, you know, we have to do this work. You know, we have to spend this money, recruit this talent, and uh, lock down our systems so that they are fully protected. And on that note, um, 
So I thank you so much. Uh, a real privilege uh, to, to finish our, our day with, with your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done.